Hey, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Author Talk or Success Life Author Talk. My name is Eric Reed. I am your host for this evening, and we will have our author, Eric, joining us in just a moment. So Author Talk came about as a result of so many of my fellow coaches and trainers and mind thinkers and transformers have been writing books and getting together and creating such great content, and I love to read. I mean, I, I, I feel like I read all the time, every day, I'm probably like consuming something. I thought it'd be so great if I could get to know the authors, get to read their books and then get them in a space where I can sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and like really talk to them about their book and, and, and be in like, ask the questions that I want to ask of the authors. And so I started reaching out to some, some friends and fellow coaches and trainers and like, what have you got? What are you writing? What are you talking about? And read what they got. And there's Eric right there. He's checking in. So tonight we're going to go into Eric's book. Um, loved the book. First, let me give you the title and all of that. Let me sell you something. Achieve success by closing more sales and building long lasting relationships. And as you can see, I've done my usual note taking chaos. So one of the things that I do when I read a book, and I'm going to sort of give you this as my hint, and you can adopt it, decide on it, decide if you like it, is I will, at the end of a book, go to the back pages, because every author leaves you like four or five blank pages in the back, and I'll write all my notes in there, like page 37, this idea, page 27, this idea, and I'll just write down the big highlights or the things that I highlighted, because often I can remember the book that I found it in, but what I can't remember is like the page or the number, and so I love to be able to pull the book off the shelf really quickly flip to the back page and be like, oh yeah, that thought was on this page. So, and then often I'll read a book more than once, the really good ones. And so I'll like make sure that I date it so that the first time through, this was what stuck out to me. The third time through, this is what stuck out to me. So I wanna encourage you just don't read a book, but learn from it, consume it devour it even if it's a you know fantasy fiction go ahead there's got to be something you can learn to it and make notes in the back make it a working resource for you to develop your skills your talents and your abilities around because so many authors pour so much of their life experience in we should be like utilizing these so all of these little tabs and notes and this recording will go in the back of this book and that way when i'm thinking about business and I'm thinking about sales and I'm thinking about B2B, I've got a resource manual right at my hands. So if you haven't bought the book, buy the book. I'm gonna go ahead and get our guest in the room. Um, he should be queued up and ready. Let me just do the little thing that we do. There he is. Up, oh, Eric, for some reason it's not letting me add you. Go ahead and say hello one more time. Try and connect. I'm not seeing it. Um, good morning, Linda, or good afternoon. Yeah, you see I'm in success coaching mode from this morning, so let me try one more time, Eric. Yeah, I'm not seeing you able to log in yet, so make sure you're on your phone, make sure your phone is turned this way, make sure you're in a strong camera mode, make sure you're watching live on the Facebook feed. Let me double twick and go over here. I'm down here fiddling. Just buy it. <laughs> I like it. Boris is like your official publisher. Boris is, yeah, you're not there yet, Eric. Something's going on with your camera. Did you allow or um, uh, provide, or make sure you're not in private mode and make sure that your camera is actually allowed on Facebook. Maybe go out and come all the way back in. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the book because we get to wait for you to click in. But I am not seeing where it's allowing me to invite you. Now I can invite your friend Boris um, and he can talk about the book if you need. Um, so wh what was interesting about the book, when I, so when I got the book, I have, I, when I first began in life, my mother always kept saying, you're such a salesman, you're a salesman, you need to go into sales, you need to be a sales guy, you're a sales guy, be a sales guy, do the sales guy thing. And I was always like running away from that because it was sort of like, I don't want to stand at Best Buy in a smock and be a salesman. Excuse me. And so I always thought that being a salesman was sort of the unknowable profession. Um, give me a hello again when you get back in the room, Eric. Like I said, I'm having a hard time connecting to you. And often that's either because your Wi-Fi is not right, 
your phone is not turned in the right direction or your camera is not allowing you to connect to Facebook. You don't have your privacy public share settings on your phone. But go ahead. And, I can wait a minute. I can talk. Lord, I do this every day. Um, I thank everybody for participating in our live TV moments. Um, anyhow, so my mother had said, you'd be in sales. You should be in sales. You'd be great in sales. Go into sales. And I did everything I could to avoid being in sales. I went and got an undergraduate degree in biochemistry. I mean, how much further away from sales could that be? Then I went and got a master's degree in family counseling and, and social work and all of that. And so I, I, I kept saying sales is a bad thing. Sales is a bad thing. Run from sales. I'm sorry, I swallowed something funny in my throat. And so it wasn't until later that I began to understand that everybody is in sales. I mean, my kids are in sales when it's pizza night and they want to get brownies and Coke as well. You know, I'm in sales mode with my spouse when I want to go off and do an adventure, spend some money, recreate something. We're always in a sales type mode. We're always trying to influence other people into a decision based on the knowledge and evidence and facts that we have at hand that we believe will benefit them in some way. And so what I love about the way Eric approached his book, and there we go, Eric. I don't know what you did different, but now we're working. What I love about the way Eric approached his book is he brought the nobility. Brought the nobility. He brought the nobility of sales he brought the back nobility there. Of sales back there. So I don't know why we're getting cheated. So I don't know why we're getting cheated. We're going to push more through it. Through it. Um, um, is it? There we go. There we go. Man, those are big. Hold on, Ian. This is fun stuff. Now, I'm if it was like, if it was a now, copier, if it was, you if it was a, a copier, you would have it fixed by now. Probably. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me can fine? You hear me? Awesome. Yes. Thank you. Cool. We killed the feedback. <laughs> I didn't realize like I had to do this over the phone. Like I'm on my computer logged in and I guess I couldn't do this over the phone. So I had to hook up my smooth mobile and all that stuff. So, so let me just do this because, you know, Eric, I got to give him a little crap because, you know, he's a Marine. So the instruction manual that I sent you that said, please only use your phone because it doesn't work on a laptop. I, yeah, I those instructions. <laughs> so the guy that calls you and says the copier is not working and you say, did you remember to uh, pull out the safety, you know, no print cartridge slip of paper or whatever. So anyhow, diving into the book. First, I always butcher your name. And it wasn't until like a couple days ago that I actually realized that your first name, Eric, isn't really your first name. I thought, oh, my God, if I tried to do his real name, I would totally butcher both pieces. So save me the embarrassment and the humiliation. Give us both names so everybody gets it right and they don't have to trust me. Oh, man. Eric Konovalov. No, but the other first name. Well, the other first name is Arkady, and I, I like to keep that one private. Oh, I, I apologize. I'm sorry. See? You're not the no only problem, one that man. has connections with the government. No, it's all good. <laughs> so... Yeah. I'm diving in because first, you're a sales guy. You take honor in being a sales guy. You love the art of selling. I do. And in your book, you really talk about the journey of coming into it. You left the military, you were a Marine, you sort of got land, dropped in the middle of nowhere, and you said, what am I going to do next in my life? And this thing called sales opened up to you. What made you think you could do it? So when I was getting out, I went to my commanding officer and I said, you know, sir, I've been doing this for eight years. No, you know, I've been doing this since I was in high school. No idea what to do when I get out. And he looked at me and said, they called me Kay because of the long last name. He's like, Kay, um, with all the BS you've sold me through the years, <laughs> get into sales. <laughs> So, I, you know, look, in the Marine Corps, there's a lot of things you don't know how to do, and you just start doing it until you figure out how to do it. And this was one of those things. And um, I got out. I really didn't know what sales was. Every Aflac agent in the world called me. <laughs> I didn't know what Aflac was. Um, I wasn't really interested in selling insurance and then stumbled on a 
company that sold copiers and printers and office equipment. And uh, it was all over from there. So I think it's interesting. So, I, so just to show you that, see, I did read the book. These are all my questions and Thank my you. special notes. And I, and I honestly, what I, so again, since you're here, before I start like quizzing you about your own book, so hopefully you wrote it, not a ghostwriter. Um, no, what I wrote I, it. What I love about it is, it's, I told you yesterday, it's not a lot of unicorn fluff. It really is like, okay, so you've been put in this position to be a sales guy. I'm gonna tell you how I became a sales guy and the team leader and the sales leader and coached other people to do it. I'm not gonna like tell you to wake up every morning and stand in front of the mirror and chant these affirmations. That's somebody else's job. My job is to teach you what a salesperson does every day. And that's why I really love right. it. Because though you, you wrote it from a B2B or a business to business perspective, most of mine is business to client, but some business to business. And I think they naturally overlap because you have to see the person to see the business. And you can't see a business without seeing the people. I was like, man, I forgot that lesson. Oh, I forgot this. Oh, man, he's doing that much better than I've ever. Like, there is really practical nuggets of building a sales business in here. It's a manual more than it is a book. So well done. I love Thank you. it. Yeah. Um, so I'm dumping in. Um, not page, well, in the introduction, I think this has always been your philosophy, and it really shows through when you quoted Jim Rohn saying, don't be a follower, be a student. Because what I saw mm -hmm. exposed over and over again in the book was how much you became a student to the process. Um, I like here where you say on page two, yeah, see, like I started right in copying and stealing stuff. It's much easier to be motivated and great at what we do when we have a plan of action in place. Mm -hmm. What I liked what you did, and if you'll go through your morning routine, which I think you share somewhere around page 10 or 11, oh, page five, page 10, that plan of action that you go through every single moment, every single morning, and why that's important to you. Page 11. <laughs> sure. Um, wow. So, you know, I, uh, I'll be honest with you. I'm a little bit guilty of it because it doesn't happen every single morning as much as I wish it, it would. But my plan, and, and I try to get there about five out of seven days per week. But the plan is I get up around 3.30 in the morning. Um, <clears throat> First thing I try to do is meditate, kind of clear, clear the mind, clear the thoughts. Um, then I journal. Actually, I have my journal right here, and um, you know, you'll see <laughs> it's kind of full. And every morning when I get up, it's almost like a brain dump. But it's so many awesome ideas that just get written down. The funny part about journaling is when you do it um, later, when I go back to read it, I don't remember what I wrote but there's some really good ideas in there. <laughs> and that's what happened with the books. Like, I'm like, oh man, this is a great idea. I'll put this in the book. Um, so yeah, meditate, journal. Um, I pray, try to read something in the morning first thing. Uh, and I like to exercise. And that's my, that's my morning routine. So I want to go back to journaling because I don't know if you watched Melissa West, who's a mutual friend of ours. The other day, she really sort of broke broke the glass around journaling where you write this happy little letter to yourself. You know, it kind of gets all fluffy. And she was like, if you're wasting that 30 minutes in your days, just like ah, sunshine talk, stop it. Because uh -huh. your journaling needs to be a yeah, downloading. <laughs> yeah. So tell me what your process to get into the flow of really quality journaling that ends up providing the momentum for you to be a success. What does success journaling look like? So when I first open up, I have this sticky note and it says, what's holding you back E and then it says me. <laughs> so it's kind of a reminder that as soon as you want to start with the, that when I want to start with any excuses right then and there, it's like, it's me. Um, I don't know what kind of quality journaling I'm doing, to be honest with you. It's a brain dump. It's whatever's on my mind. As a matter of fact, 
the way I got into journaling is I hired a coach and she said, you got a journal. And I'm like, well, what's journaling? You know, this was like three years ago. I'm like, what's, I've never journaled before. She's just like, just sit down and start writing. And my very first entry was, what do I write? <laughs> well, I can write about what am I thinking about? What's going right? What's going well? And later it became really good. And now in the mornings I can have um, rampage of appreciation sometimes. You know, when you wake up, if you, how do we, how do we become joyful, right? We can, be, we can wake up and be angry because of something that happened yesterday. Or if that's the case, how do we change our mood really quick? And the best way to do that is to think of everything in your life that's good. So what if you take the first two minutes, three minutes, and just write out everything you love about your life? I love my kids. I love my family. I'm grateful for my job. I'm grateful for my boss. I love this friend, this friend, and just list them out. I love this person because this is what they do to me. And by the time you're done in two minutes, you're, my, well, my whole mood just changes. So that's why it's important. That's why when people see me in the gym at 4.35 in the morning, they're like, how are you awake? <laughs> you know, like, I've been awake and, you know, I, I kind of got myself into that mood. And the reason why that's in the book is because in sales, look, we're all human beings. We're all dealing with so much crap in our life. But in sales, especially when we're showing up and we have to add value to somebody, if we're not in peak state, most likely we're not going to attract the right people. And so that, uh, to me, that's why that's what journaling has to do with this book is because it gets me in the right state of mind to handle the rest of the day. And, and I'm a lover of journaling and often I'll start with a question or I'll just flip open a book or something that I'm reading and I'll just like drop my finger in the middle of it. And whatever that sentence is, I'm like, okay, how much can you think into that one sentence? Like how... Because I think sometimes we go through life and somebody will drop us a quote, like, don't be a follower, be a student. And we're like, oh, that's cool. But like, okay, what does it mean to be a student? What does a student look like? How does a student show up? How am I showing up? And I can like, for three hours, write on that kind of stuff. So I love journaling. If you're yeah. not a journaler and you're wondering what journaling looks like, hey, reach out to either one of us. We'll give you prompts, we'll give you coaching. But I think you're right in sales especially we need to get centered so that when we walk into that client, they see us as balanced and in position to be of service, which I think is what I love. So I'm jumping around in your book, but I like when you say focusing on helping organizations by aligning their product, by aligning your products and services with their objectives in mind guarantees success. And um, I think there's a couple other places you bring that message home over and over again about you may not be the solution for every person. You're not. How do you quench or silence that fear of if I don't make the sale today, if I don't hit my numbers, if I don't get my number of calls, my number of leads, my number of convert. Like if my numbers don't line up, I'm out of here. So I got to sell something. Otherwise I'm done. How do you balance that with being who you are? I think that may have been my mindset or maybe I've just always been too stupid to realize that if I don't hit my numbers, I'm gone. And in the beginning that was kind of like, I got to make a sale. I got to make a sale. Um, but I've made some wrong sales. Like I've sold people stuff that they hated after and I couldn't sell them something else down the road. And that was the, you know, that was, I went from that mindset of it's all about me to making a sale. And then I heard Zig Ziglar say, if you can help enough other people achieve what they want, you'll definitely achieve what you want. And I try to live by that. So if I'm in a selling environment, if it's not the right fit, it's not the right fit. I'll tell the person it's not the right fit. And what I've, what I found, and I've done that a few times in my career, and what I found is people really appreciate that. They get attracted to your honesty. A lot of times they have a referral for you because you're that guy that said, look, I'm, honestly, this isn't for you. Go with my competitor. And you can always come back with you know, holding your head high as the guy that said, last time my product wasn't for you, but now I have the right product. And they'll listen to you. So it can be about us. Like in sales... If we can shift the focus from me to you, the client, I think it'll go a lot further than just, hey, buy my product, buy my product.
So, and I want to go. But while you guys are here, buy my book, buy my um, book. Yeah, it's a really good book, <laughs> by the way. Um, Thanks. Man. So, we're going to go through your process because I think it's about chapter six or so. You start to really ask the question, like, show me your process. Show me your process. Like, show me the process. And if you don't have a process yeah. in place, you're not a salesperson. Um, which you sort of allude to when you say just because you make more calls doesn't mean you'll be successful at scheduling an appointment with your prospect, your prospective client. I realize that even a blind squirrel will find an acorn one day. <laughs> and I laugh because <laughs> <laughs> I come from a sales background. I've been in that lead generation mentality of like, make your 60 calls every day and track your numbers. And you know that after our 30 calls, you'll be able to do this next appointment, you know, like that whole matrix kind of mentality. And I was all yeah. about the numbers guy. But what I began to realize was that there were points that even though I was setting the appointment, I wasn't getting the sale. I wasn't going to the next level. And I think that's where I want you to really talk about that process where the call and I tell my clients all the time, you're not on the phone to sell them something. So don't think of it as a cold call or, you know, online sales. You're on the call to do what? To gather info and understand. I mean, picture being a doctor, right? I tell this to every single salesperson I meet or train or coach. You're the doctor. When you show up to the doctor, now imagine, let's say you, you have a product and you're showing up to sell that product. Now, when we translate that to a doctor mentality, um, you show up to the doctor and imagine doctor saying, oh my God, I got the best medicine and it's 50% off and it's going to get rid of your headache within five minutes. And you look at the doctor and you're like, doc, I got a knee pain, <laughs> right? What does the doctor do? First, they have you fill out, I don't know, 75 different forms to really understand what brought you in today, right? Hey, where are you? What's hurting? Circle the smiley face on a scale of zero to 15 of how <laughs> angry or in this pain you are. This is coming from somebody else. Um, go ahead. Yeah, and then you, you, know, you, go in, you wait, you go into the room, and then the doctor come in, comes in, and they want to know about your history. Tell me, does your family have high blood pressure? Are you allergic to any medications? What was your experience before this? What's your lifestyle like? They completely examine you before they start um, really examining you physically. Then they take blood work to really understand what's cooking, and then they make a recommendation. We have to be just like that in a sales world. So the first appointment really, um, you know, obviously there's ways to get the first meeting, and that's through cold calling, networking, emails, whatever. I mean, it's in the book. There's a lot of different ways you can get the meeting. But once you get that meeting, your job is not to sell anything because you don't know what their needs are. You have no idea if there's any pain points. So our job is to either uncover a pain point or a pleasure destination that they want to get to. Okay, catch that, you guys. And un so your job when meeting first to first with a client or prospective client is what discover the pain point or determine the pleasure or, destination like we can't recognize yeah, for example, the plane. i got it in my head go ahead go yeah there there might not be a pain point right like i have a car right now that i absolutely love love my car that i drive but i drove a friend of mine's tesla <laughs> <laughs> and guess what now i love the tesla it doesn't mean i don't love my car like there's no pain point in my car but I'm researching Teslas, right? And I'm getting my mind like, okay, uh, next one might be a Tesla for me. Um, so it, it's either like if there isn't, hey, I'm hurting and I want to get away from this. And there isn't, hey, I'd love to, you know, grow my business to the next level or whatever it is, you know, that you sell. If it's real estate, I know there's a few real estate agents that are watching this. If it's, hey, I'm in a condo now, we're about to have twins. And I'd like to get a bigger house, you know, right now there's no pain point, but there's going to be a pleasure point. Then, then you start looking and the questions could be, okay, well, what kind, of, what kind of home life are you going to expect? How many bedrooms? Are you planning to have a playroom for the kids? What about guests? Are you going to have a nanny, right? So you start asking all these types of questions. I've never been a real estate agent before, but that's probably what I would do if I was one. You can be one. Um, I, you've already passed like 90% of the test. <laughs> I actually had my license before. I just, that wasn't for me. Well, but I think what, 
I want, and we, there's four more steps, I think, in your process. And that what I love about the way you take the book is you actually like, okay, so when I'm in this meeting, this is my objective. This is my strategy. This is where mm -hmm. I know that the meeting has been successful. So during that, that first meeting, getting the appointment, you may not even be talking to the decision maker because you're walking around like, okay, you're in charge of IT. You're in charge of production. You're in charge of HR. Like, tell me all of the things that make your day miserable or what would make your day wonderful? So I can go back and then begin, a, using the doctor analogy, send this stuff out for some lab work to see what's going on and if there's anything that we can do to treat the condition. And then the, after you- Yeah, have, and there's a whole process in that first meeting, Eric, in the book, it's exactly the types of questions that we ask, right? So today questions, kind of like, tell me about where you are right now. Uh, tomorrow questions, where would you like to be? Um, stop sign questions, what's stopping you from being where you'd like to be? Magic wand questions is if I gave you a magic wand, money was no issue whatsoever and you can wave it and create anything you want in your environment, what would you create? And then the payout questions are, hey, if you were able to create that, what would that mean to you? And the reason why it's designed that way is because Look, we're human beings. We, we buy based on emotion. I mean, I think everybody knows that people buy emotionally. They justify it logically. So when I'm discovering what their pleasure point is or what their pain point is, I want to tie that to some kind of an emotion. Like in what we sell, if I can help you increase your bottom line profits by reducing your expenses in these areas that you didn't even manage before, what would that mean to you on your next review with the boss? And by the way, if we can measure it quarterly, right? Because that's what they want. They want to get promoted. They want to do something great for the company. They don't care about the copier. Nobody, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, hey, I want to buy a copier. No, they want to stop paper jams or they want to print out a very nice crisp paper. Nobody wants to well, actually, homes are an emotional thing because I think it's a status symbol. So people want to buy a home in a certain neighborhood and certain size. To some, that's important. So I guess we got to understand our clients' wants and needs, but there's always an emotion attached to it. What, what I love, and so again, you guys, if you're like, well, I don't sell copiers or I don't sell, you know, office furniture, this doesn't apply. When you go back and you look at, I believe it's chapter seven, and those questions are laid out. And that's what I loved when I was reading those. I'm like, oh my gosh, I could use that as a coach when I'm asking prospective coaching clients. I could use that as a, a speaker, a trainer, somebody involved in this soft science, so to speak, because they really do have the same objective. It may not look like a paper jam, but they've got a jam in their personnel. They've got a jam in their team dynamics. They've got a jam in their business flow. And if I sit down and I call them the gap questions and are willing to stand in the gap and say, okay, you're here, what would it look like if we went here? Like, what is the missing piece? Um, I loved those questions and I like tore them up and I was like, man, I'm stealing these questions. Because you do them in a really Thanks, nice, uh, I mean, they really, so in, in my business, I'll often say, you gotta know your scripts. And people are like, I, I don't do scripts, that's not me. I'm like fool you need to know where you're going every football player gets on the field and knows the entire game now they adapt the game based on the plays and the systems and what's going on but they got to know what the next play is before they go out onto the field or they're going to get slaughtered that's all scripts are and so i love the way in the book you sort of gave us some principles of scripts or some ideas of scripts or strategies like look if you just go in and ask these things you'll be 10 miles ahead of the next guy because he's just going in and winging it and flinging it. And I can tell that you didn't just like steal them out of a book that you lived and learned them. I did. Every word. <laughs> <laughs> Every word the hard way, he says. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm jumping around to my question tabs. Um, feel free to stop me. So, um, so one of the so we already talked about where you talk in chapter um, four about show me your process. I want to so are you good? You're good. 
Um, you're probably getting a lot of feedback. I apologize. So your process. No, I turned it up. Okay, your process on page 39 is initial contact, which you're calling cold mm -hmm. calling, phone calls, email, strategic stop buys, and networking. The introduction meeting, the analysis, the proof of concept slash demonstration, validation meeting, proposal, mm -hmm. close, implementation meeting, post sale, and becoming a magnet for referrals. See, I did read the book. You're like, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. As I'm getting older, I'm getting better at remembering. So walk us through, so we kind of went through the introduction meeting, the analysis meeting. Talk about how you present that proof of concept, that demonstration meeting. How do you move into that space without becoming my solutions, the only and very best solution, and you gotta buy now before midnight tonight kind of guy? Yeah, I've never been that guy. Um, I always want to get to the point where the client feels like they've made that decision because, well, everybody loves to buy and they hate to be sold, right? So the proof of concept in copiers, we call it a demo. Um, so we bring them into our location. We show them the business. We show them that, hey, if you have an issue when you call, here's who you talk to. We introduce them to the people. And then I bring them right up to the device or the solution that I want to recommend. And I say, here's what I'm thinking based on our conversation, our initial meeting, and based on everything we've discovered in our walkthrough, I think this is the best solution for you and here's why, but you let me know if you don't think so and we'll find something else. So I go through it and I show them what I think and I say, what do you think of that? And they'll either say, we love this or we don't. And if they don't, we're gonna continue on the conversation until they tell me what they love. So here's what I want you guys to hear because when you read it in the book, it'll jump out at you that the proof of concept is not the sales pitch. Did you notice he didn't say, here's my solution, it'll cost you $14.95. He said, here's what I'm proposing, here's what I heard you say you need, here's what I think is gonna fit, put it on, get comfortable, test drive it, kick it, roll it around, talk about it, tell me if I heard you correctly and if I'm on the right track. I think so often in sales, we're afraid that if we don't give the price, then we haven't, I always say that price is, well, my friend taught me that, price is only a factor in the absence of value. And so we tend to lead with price because we don't know our value. We haven't done, as you said, the proof of concept, the validation piece of the sales pitch. We've just said, well, if we can get them like to like the price, then they'll like the concept. Until they, as I have this rule that until the client tells me and agrees on the solution, I don't give them price. So it's funny. There's I've been way too many times where we've showed up with a proposal and then it needed to get changed. Well, I don't like this. I don't like that. Can you change this? Can you add this? Take away this. And you've already played your cards. They already know what it costs with or without some things that they want. So now they expect your price to either go down or go up. And that's why I try not to show my price until they tell me that we agreed on a solution. And if I can, I find out what their budget is for it. And then if I can, we try to come in within somewhere close to their budget. So it's a win-win and they created the solution. So in the real estate world, we, I, 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 te I tell agents this all the time. So typical agents will like come over to the house to do the official listing presentation and they'll walk through and say, oh, what a beautiful kitchen you have. And oh, what a beautiful paint job. And oh, this carpet looks fresh, but we're going to need to fix that. We're going to need to update that. And we're gonna, like, they start talking about it. And then they sit down at the table and they start negotiating the price of the sale of the house. Meanwhile, the seller is like, well, wait a minute. You told me that I need to put like $10,000 worth of remodeling you need to put that on top of the price you're gonna sell my house for. And it's like, no, 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 no. Let's determine what your home's value is in the market, and then let's make sure your house is prepared. So those realtors that are listening, if you're doing it backwards, don't tell them everything that needs to be fixed before you tell them what its value is in the marketplace, because they're gonna pile all that stuff on top. So I think it's the same thing in copying. It's like, oh, by the way, we wanted an automatic stapler added in, and you're like, wait a minute, you didn't tell me that's what you needed. And now I told you it's going to be a 1000 yeah. 
Because I like the automatic stapler. I like the automatic folder. <laughs> I find copiers to be somewhat kind of cool and somewhat sexy because, you know, they're like, they done right. They're better than a Tesla. I got to tell you. So I want to go in. Yeah, yeah. I'd rather drive a copier on the highway. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from a man who has a big, loud Harley. It's a Harley or an Indian? It's a Harley. I'm sorry. You gave me this look like, why would you even mention any other bike? No, I love Indian. I mean, it's a beautiful bike. Um, so then we go into the validation, the validation meeting. So talk about the validation meeting and then the proposal, how those two are separated so and why they need to happen. Mm -hmm. So the validation meeting and the um, proof of concept can happen together or if there was a change that they requested or an addition at the proof of concept, then when you come to a validation meeting, pretty much it's a proposal without any price. And it's you once again saying, hey, when we met, you mentioned these were your challenges. Has anything changed? They'll say yes or no. If yes, take notes down. You're going to need another validation meeting. You're not coming back with pricing. So based on what you said your challenges were and where you wanted to get to, here's what we're recommending. Um, Here's where we're going to place these things. You know, we'll add some security, IT services, whatever. What do you think, Mr. Customer? And the leader said, yeah, this is exactly what I want. Or they'll say no. And if they say yes, at that point, you can present pricing. Uh, a lot of times I go back and I schedule, you know, I'll just say, hey, let's schedule a time for me to come in with pricing maybe tomorrow or something else. Um, or we'll actually have pricing with us just in case they agree to everything, right, to speed it up a little bit. But until they agree, that's the key. The validation meeting is the client telling us exactly what they want to buy. It's the key meeting. It's probably the most second most important, if not the most important meeting in the whole process. So listen, listen, people that aren't selling copiers, listen, people that are selling coaching and fitness and books. On, you can't start talking about pricing until you get buy in. They, the consumer, the other side is always skeptical. They're always holding that last little card in their pocket because that's just our nature. That until you can sit down and go, okay, everything clear? Like, is everything clear? Like, we have reached an agreement that what I'm providing to you suits or sits your needs. And as soon as they can say that with yes and not have the comma but, don't move into pricing because as long as that but exists, they're not going to be able to agree to any number because the number is not what's holding them back. It's the solution or the buy-in or that you haven't relieved enough pain or as Eric said, taking them to the place of pleasure visually in their mind. Yeah, I mean, there's so many broke people out there that are running around with a thousand dollar iPhone or $300 <laughs> pairs of Easy's or whatever they are, right? Um, and it's because of the status that they get. It's because of the way it makes them feel. So a lot of times I see sales reps making a mistake because they say, well, I wouldn't pay for that, so my client probably won't, so I can't charge them that much. And that can really hurt us in sales. Um, usually that happens because we didn't really understand what's valuable to them. So in order to add value to someone, we need to understand what they perceive to be valuable first. And you do that through questions and through that whole process. Okay. You guys, thousand dollar answer. Right? Like this is worth the price of the book plus $5 more. You should send them just as a thank you. Um, your product is not the solution. Your product, whatever it is you're selling is not what they're buying. What they're buying is a sense that whatever you bring satisfies their need. Whatever it is that you present mm -hmm. has to begin with them and connect to them. Like you said, people are running around with thousand dollar iPhones that cannot put gas in their car. That are like swiping the WIC card to buy groceries. And it's like, why? Because they perceived more pleasure in that iPhone than having a new car, upgrading their apartment, paying off their credit card debt. They, per they perceived not that there was more value in an iPhone 10, but it was because their perception was that there was value and pleasure 
So they were willing to pay any price to get it, including going in debt for 10 years, if that's what it takes. <laughs> in 10 years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, that's true. I've got a cousin that rotates cars like every two years because that's when the lease starts to get like off balance. I'm like, how do you get a new, like, yeah. oh, wait, you don't own a car. You're just long-term renting your lifestyle. Yeah. So I love, oh, man, you are so good. Is your boss watching, Thanks, by you. the way? Is he over here? Because is Boris your boss or just um, a coworker? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> Boris is a long, he was the best man at my wedding. Oh. He's a, he's one of my best, you know, he's the best friend of mine. We grew up so, together. So he's seen your sales pitch firsthand at the highest level on that altar. Yeah, he's seen that sales pitch when I was in high school pitching to girls to go out. You know, what I mean? <laughs> he's your rider. It's all sales. There, there's secrets that <laughs> die right. with Boris. All right, so Boris, keep them secret. Yeah. So I want to go into um our our main goal for cold calling is to schedule a meeting with the decision maker. If the person is not available, the secondary goal is to gather as much information as possible, and then you have um cold calling versus appointment setting. And then I love the scheduling a meeting with the decision maker and do not give the person at the front desk a reason to turn you, turn you away. I put in my margin notes. See, I even put margin notes in here. Um, don't take no from someone that can't say yes. That's right. How There aren't many people that can say yes to you, but a lot can say no. So how do you push past that no person without running over them, so to speak, without losing. Because, yeah, I mean, you go up to the receptionist. Can I talk to the guy that manages your IT services? No. And that's where most of us get stuck in the sales thing is that first no is like somebody just kicked our knees out from under us and we don't know how to get up again. Yeah, so the question I typically ask at that level is, what's the best way to go about scheduling a meeting with your IT person or whoever handles your IT? And that's not a yes or no question. They can't say no to that question. <laughs> what is the best way to schedule a meeting with the decision maker as it relates to, go to what about, I, to go about scheduling a meeting with the decision yeah. maker who would handle this? With, with your director of IT or I'll throw in, a, you know, hopefully I'll do a quick research on LinkedIn or Google or something. I'll know the CFO's name is, you know, Bill Johnson or something. And I'll walk in and I'll say, hey, my name's Eric. What's the best way to schedule a meeting with uh, Bill Johnson? And, well, you know, you can email him or call him. Do you mind giving me his info? By the way, does he handle his own calendar or is that something you do? No, he handles his own or he has an assistant. Do you mind giving me her information? And I go, see, I'm not giving them anything. I'm not telling them what I do. Like, I think I talk about don't spill your beans in the lobby in the book, right? Um, because as soon as you walk in, you say, hey, this is Eric, and I'm with, you know, DCA Imaging Systems, by the way, the best company to buy your office equipment from. <laughs> um, I'm with DCA Imaging Systems, and we help organizations with their copier, printers, IT services, blah, 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 blah. They're like, oh, yeah, we're not interested in that. But if I say what's the best way to schedule a meeting with Bill Johnson? She can't say she's not interested in that. She might get in trouble for it, one, right? Or he, whoever's at the... Um, the gatekeeper, as you I'm call them. using him. the right pronouns. I got hit. Yeah, the gatekeeper. There you go. Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, we got to be really strategic about the questions we ask and don't ask the question that you can get a no to. So, and you guys, just so you know, Flash in the book again. A lot of what he just said, is he actually wrote down in the book. But I loved when I read that because it was like, oh, my gosh. Don't spill your beans in the lobby. Don't rush the sale, as we've heard. Like, what is the best way of getting in touch with the person that managed your HR document services? I think is a, another example you give in the book. Because yeah. me not being in your industry never realized that HR has a whole different level of document servers and securities and ITs and all of this stuff. And if I went to the front lobby and I said to the lady standing there between 11 and two, because it changes because she only works half days because she's got kids at home and the other one come, Hey, how can I, you know, I'd like to talk to you about your copy or server. She's like, I don't need to deal with you. I've got enough problems and I get paid by the hour. 
And right now, nobody's asked me to find a copier guy. So you're at the wrong place at the wrong time in front of the wrong person. That's right. And that person there is being told what to do all day long. So the second they get a chance to say no to somebody, they will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because remember, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but that's not their job description is to research HR security document systems. If it was, they'd be off yeah. on a special project researching HR document security systems. But what their job is to provide information about the company. And so standing there saying, what is the best way for me to get in touch with your HR team or your HR director? Do they, have a, do they manage their own calendar? Do they have an assistant? Is there anything unusual about their schedule in the next couple of weeks? Because I'd really like to get on it. I now walk away with a name, and a number, where... and a connection. Sorry. Yeah. And this is where being a student really pays off because if you can – like I tell my reps, I don't care if you take a whole Monday or Friday afternoon and, and spend five hours on just researching, you're going to get way more bang for your buck than running into a building, not knowing where you're going, knocking on 20 doors and, you know, hopefully throwing spaghetti on the wall, hoping something will stick. So if we have an opportunity, like the VP of HR, director of HR, you can easily find them for any organization. Just look up the company on LinkedIn, search the title that you're looking for, and they'll pop up. Or Google VP of HR for ABC Company, and their name will pop up with a link to their LinkedIn, right? That's not, that's not a secret. However, the student aspect comes in where we understand what regulations are coming out now that affect the people in HR. What challenges are they dealing with as it pertains to paperwork? How are they onboarding people? Like when somebody shows up, are they handing them a packet of 35 different pages to fill out where 17 of those are redundant with last name, first name? And can we automate that? Because I know that after the candidate wrote it out, now they has to go to somebody in HR who they're paying a salary to, and that person now has to retype that information into the, their HR system. So if I know these are real challenges with HR, my call to that VP of HR would sound something like, hey, I'm trying to, I was hoping to get on your calendar for about 15 minutes. I have some ideas that can really free up your staff's time and help you stay compliant with the new regulations that are out. Are you available next Wednesday for us to chat? And oh, you're so good. I bet you get a gold circle award this year. <laughs> um, because as you well, I give it to myself. So thanks. <laughs> oh, sorry, I saw the whiteboard you bought. So take that as your prize. Um, well, and on page yeah, one, I love that thing. I, I bet on page one twenty one, you say, "What problem are you solving? Why would they buy it from me?" Um, sales is more about listening and understanding than it is about speaking and making yourself look good. It's never about the seller, and it's always about the buyer. What I loved about that example that you brought in with the HR director is you said, okay, let me show up one, knowing who they are, what their struggles are, what some of their strategies are in the average day. Not going to know their whole job, but at least let them know that I'm coming with some level of, of understanding of who they are and bring something of service along the way. Understanding that there's a new document, a new law of compliance. There's something that's going on that one of our products or services could help facilitate them in doing their job better and at a higher level. And that's where I often will tell yeah. people in sales, you're not cold calling, you're seeking appointments to provide an opportunity to be of service. Like there are John Maxwell team members that are watching this right now. I see you guys. And John Wayne's like, over I there. I charge 15. <laughs> yeah, John Wayne, that's my buddy, man. Uh, that's my Paraguay buddy. Love that guy. Um, so we have access to this leadership board game that nobody else does. It's such a unique thing that, that we have as John Maxwell coaches who have invested in that leadership game. So when I met some people who were VPs of HR or directors of HR, I typically say, hey, I got the most unique, fun tool in the market that helps you develop leaders in your organization. Do you have 15 minutes for me to come in and show it to you? That's it. I show up with the game 10 minutes early and I set it up. And I stack the deck. So I put the really good cards on top 
and then I get him to roll the die <laughs> and pick the card. I say, can you imagine having this conversation? What would it be like if somebody in your department, like you're probably thinking of someone who can use this game right now. Who is that person? What department are they in? What would happen if they asked, were asked this question? And then their brains are turning, right? So now they're like, oh my God, we need this. And, and that, that's, a, that's an easy, easy sell. So, and, I, and again, if you're, if whatever you're doing in your business that you're trying to grow it, the price conversation has got to leave your thinking. You have got to stop basing everything on what should I charge. And you've been on those calls where somebody's like, well, what should I charge for my coaching? And they get the most vague and unknown answer and they get frustrated and yeah. hang up. And it's like, well, that's the dumbest question. And when I say dumb, I mean that with somewhat of a, a kind heart. It's like, well, what is the value that you're bringing? Because if I'm standing on the edge of a cliff and the gravel is falling out from underneath my feet and you're the only guy within 100 miles that has a rope, price is not going to be my biggest issue. My biggest issue is how fast can you get here and tie it to the tree and throw it to me and save my butt? And then I'm willing to pay yeah. you whatever I need. When you go into these meetings, and I, we need to clarify that you don't sell the $200 home Office Depot refill it yourself kind of printer. You're talking <laughs> opportunities <laughs> that net sales are an yeah. average sale day for you or a good sale. Like, yeah, that, that just hit my little sweet spot. I mean, just thinking back this year, a couple of good sales were, you know, really good ones were $500,000, $800,000. So, um, an average sale in our industry is about eight grand. So if you're not selling copiers, but you would like to make eight mm -hmm. grand with a call or 50 grand or 100 grand. And I know in the book you mentioned, was it a university or it was a university you captured? Wasn't it a contract for a university? Yep. That one sounded big. Mm -hmm. That sounded that was like in my previous life. That sounded like a million dollar deal. Hopefully, that was a good one. Hopefully, you got residuals on that for life. But if you want to make that hundred thousand, <laughs> no, unfortunately, when you leave, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been attempting no leave. Um, but if you're like eight thousand, I want a hundred thousand dollar contract. It's still the same thing. It's just that you're shifting out the product, but the process to getting it done is the exact same thing. He's, and what I, again, with the book, you guys, again, I'll show the title. Let me sell you something. It's available on Amazon. And by the way, the, it. the, it's so, thanks, Eric. You know, the title came from, let me, let me sell you something instead of let me tell you something, because as I discussed in the book, you know, selling isn't telling. But so many people have come up to me and they're like, hey, is that from, you know, in living color back in the day with Fire Marshal Bill where he's like, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Like, and I'm no, I didn't have him in mind when I came up with that. Well, and it's funny because the guy in the cover <laughs> reminds me of the millionaire real estate agent that's in New York for some reason. Um, but what I honestly, and, you know, I don't get residuals off this. I do off the copy sales that will happen as a result of this. But um, it's a really practical step-by-step -step analysis of understanding the sales process. And that's what I really like about this. I mean, I can transfer what you teach in sales into B2B, B2C, you know, coaching clients, speaking engagements, whatever it is, because you really say, okay, here's, I'm going to, I'm going to bring you inside the copy world, but if you're bright enough to read the book, you can scratch out the word copy and put in contract or speaking or Amway or makeup or whatever it is you're trying to sell and get your Johnny hustle on and create a change in your life. None of this is proprietary to what you do every day, but what it is is a great example of how you do it so well every day. Yeah, thank you. Now, you currently lead a team of salespeople? Yep. How many are on your team? Yeah, we've got a team of about, 
About 12. I mean, some are direct and others are supporting, but it's about 12 on a daily basis. Companies, DCA Imaging Systems, we're in Atlanta, Maryland. So, uh, I, you know, I, DC, Virginia. We'll need the Maryland. t-shirt, DC Imaging. Um, so DCA. I, DCA. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, no problem. As a team leader in a sales environment, mm -hmm. of course they got to hit their numbers. Of course they got to do production. Of course they've got to be doing, you know, as you said, um, somewhere in there just because, you know, don't confuse busy with productive. Um, I forgot where you said it, but you said it. So I'm giving you credit for it for at least two more times. Um, how do you keep them in production and moving forward and still keep them motivated and excited to show up for work as opposed to being a number, you know, junkie. Yeah. Um, we rarely ever talk about numbers. That's it's weird. I know in sales, but rare, we rarely ever, unless we're like not hitting the numbers we need to hit, then it's like, Hey guys, here, here's where we are and here's what we need to catch up. But those conversations are rare and that's specific because, um, you don't want salespeople under pressure feeling like they have to make a number because they won't make the right decision for their client when they're out in the field. And we have to make sure that we're taking care of the client first. So that's number one. Number two, hiring right. So I wish I was able to take credit for my team, but like the, the top performers were there before I got there, right? So they're kind of making me look good. Um, I, I got really lucky with, with some of the guys on my team. They're just amazing. And then it's hire right. One thing I haven't done yet is I haven't hired anybody straight out of college with no experience, nothing. Like everyone we bring on board has had years of experience because I, my mentality up until this point has been let them train, get trained by at least two other companies, figure out what's not working for them, and then um, once they're ready to settle down and commit, uh, we'll talk to them. Hey, sorry, my battery's saying it's low. Let me plug in, okay? Go ahead. I'm on this, like, swivel thingy. That was all. That was all. Was that? I was going to say that was also part of the instruction. I was going to say that was also part of the instruction. <laughs> okay, this will work. Okay. I'm good. Are you good? I'm good. Yeah, I think I'm good. Is everybody in the room good? Let's give a thumbs up, a happy, a smiling. It's like, come on, Maureen, follow the rules. I mean, yeah. I, if it was John Wayne, a <laughs> Coast Guard, he, you know what's funny is John got the same thing. He read it. He highlighted it. He turned it into like Morse code and two other instructions. And then he sent me back yeah. improvements on it because he's a Coast Guard. I mean, you know, they, they, that guy is impressive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I yeah. should have realized Coasties. that I was dealing with a Marine. I should have put like some food on it or something so that you would I need at least Barney style. I need like, I, I need, I, I need like Barney and, you know, whatever other dinosaurs they have to explain it to me. Like I'm five. <laughs> it's, I, hey, you've got, now your boys are 10 and eight, somewhere around that. They're nine and five. Nine, nine and five. And five. <sighs> yeah. Lord, nine is nine. My nine-year-old. I've got a nine-year-old boy, so that uh, uh, he's discovering deodorant. I'm not sure why, but that's his new thing. Oh my gosh! I know, which totally made me start thinking. Wait a minute! In six, eight years, he's going to be in a car. He's going to be with girls. He's going to be riding and dying with his buddies down the street. I'm not ready for all that. Um, I remember five. That's five funny. was good. Five was good. That was when we discovered Captain America, and we shared a lot of silly things. Five has a sense of humor. So I'm a huge Ravens fan. I'm in Baltimore, right? Or outside. The five-year-old, this is what he drew me. Steelers. <laughs> Daddy said, Daddy's a Steelers fan. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that's my, that's my, he's funny. <laughs> well, I love seeing the family pictures because it truly, I mean, they are your boys. I mean, First, they are. the DNA didn't get very far away from your side of the family. 
Um, <laughs> Thanks. But and, and poor guys, <laughs> poor guys. Yeah, and you're you're like me. You're a very physical dad. It's like there's always a wrestling match, and I'm generally the one who gets in trouble for breaking something, <laughs> even though I try and blame <laughs> them. It's immediately like. Um, no, you were the adult in the room. You should have stopped it before it got to that level. Yeah. So I know how it is. So, yeah, I mean, and so you have two little salesmen right now with Christmas around the corner. And uh, I'm sure that they've got They're their Christmas good. list. And <laughs> <laughs> so going back to it, because you said we talked a couple of weeks. Is there a book number two coming? Yeah, so, you know, writing a book, number one, I feel like I've put everything I know into this book. <laughs> so now I think I'm thinking about book number two. And book number two might be taking some of those chapters and breaking them down and just creating more. But what is coming is an online course of this book where it's a step-by-step -step process. It's kind of like a done for you. And I'm working with Amy Harrell, who's... I mean, she's got an online course to teach you how to create online courses and um, can't wait for that thing to be out. So the reason why I said that is because I think that all of us need a coach like we're or a trainer or somebody. Right. I mean, we can only get to where we are now with the same thinking that we've been thinking. <laughs> so we all need somebody new to, to help us see what's the next level for us. And when I thought, well, online course would be good, I realized that I know nothing about creating an online course. And so I'm working with Amy to help me out with that. So I want you guys to hear, he has a coach. He coaches. He has a trainer. And I'm sure you probably have more than one coach. My guess is you probably have two or three. Oh, yeah. I mean, with the JMT, I mean, we, we're just packed with mentors and just the community of people we're hanging out with. Everybody seems to be a coach these days, and uh, it's awesome. It's awesome to, to get others to help you think through things. Well, and what I will say is the online course is you should be able to get CE credits at the local college for it if it's anything like the book. Um, honestly, and again, you guys, I've been in sales. I, I've been around sales. I've been a high producing realtor. I've led teams. My last team was the number one team uh, in Georgia, number three in the country, number three in the world. And when I sat down with this, it was pretty quick. Like in the first 10 minutes, I was like, oh, Lord, this is going to be a hard read. Like this is going to really require me to learn, to grow, to take notes, to evaluate how I'm selling, how I'm thinking, what I'm doing. And so it was worth the read. It was real. I mean, I, I, dude, I've got like all these little things I got to translate and start using. And I really do appreciate Thanks, the Eric. fact that you didn't just like make it. And you did this in the middle of recovering from open heart surgery too, right? Well, it started before, before the surgery it took about nine months to write the book, but it got finished while I was at home recovering. Yeah. So yeah, I'm supposed to be on Fun bed stuff. rest, watching TV, not exercising, not stressing, but let me just write a book. <laughs> well, I have nothing going on at the office. <laughs> let me just write a book <laughs> and let me make it an awesome book for salespeople to grow and develop their business. Um, but I can really see you did pour a lot into it and that you really did pack in some meat. Um, so the online course is going to be phenomenal. I mean, I, if you're, if you can't escape sales, it's all around you, no matter what you're doing. So why not do it at the highest level and why not be coached by somebody that's currently doing it at the highest level in leading others to do it. So this isn't just fluff book. This is actual practical experience. Um, I like where you close out it's sort of around page one. 35, not sort of around, it actually is. Closing a sale is not where the success is. This is where, this is simply where you rec you are recognized for your success with this customer. Break that open, yeah. break that open. Yeah, so I mean, closing a sale, that's the result, right? That's equivalent to becoming a champion in the ring or getting the gold medal. And you hear these champions say it all the time. Well, the success happens in the off season. Like Emmett Smith had that commercial, right? Um, Michael Phelps trains better than anybody else trains. 
And in sales, um, the way when you close the deal, that's just being recognized for the relationship we've built, for the trust we've built, for the understanding of clients' needs that we gained, and for presenting the solution that they actually feel comfortable getting, uh, you get rewarded by the sale. But the success comes all along the way. So did you hear that? So I, and this is what I see happen so often is people will jump to the, the sale, try and get to the end. And you said, no, wait a minute, there's this whole process. And again, you lay it out in the book. There's this whole process that if you walk through strategically with intentionality and sincerity, the sale is going to be inevitable. The close is going to be inevitable. You're going to get paid, maybe not directly by them, but somewhere, somewhere down the line, you'll cash in on it. So don't be looking down towards the sale. Don't be like, okay, if I hit that, then that gives me my fourth number of the month, which means I'm going to be on target. I'm going to hit my quarterly goals. I'm going to get the free trip to the Bahamas. How do I close the sale? Until you've done the other six, seven process steps that are required to earn. And I always say it's earning the right to the sale, to the close. You have to earn that position to be able to say, as I say in one of my scripts, if you feel comfortable and confident, let's go ahead and sign here and get this started for you. Uh, that's really good. Yeah. And, and it's like, I reaffirm that you're comfortable and confident in what I said and who we are and the relationship we're going to build. So I just need you to sign here so we can get this started. But I'm not allowed to ask that question until I've given them comfort and confidence, trust and solution. Till I fully listened. And that's right. You so, I know people are going to think I just like your book. Um, you so do a great job in laying out how to achieve that. So um, I know your boys. So I'm going to show you how bad of a dad I was. So I knew we were going to be doing this. So I ordered pizza that was delivered while we were here. The kids were like doing their own pizza thing in the other room. So like, I, See, I'm, I'm killer dad. I was like, look, I got to cover my bases and make sure dinner's taken care of tonight. So as we close out, nice. what do you want us to take away? What is it like you want the message to be that defines tonight? The message at the end of the day is if you're in any kind of sales or if you want somebody to buy from you, if you can, you got to answer the question, um, why would they buy this product? And if you're not able to answer it, why would they buy this product or why would they buy this service? If you're not able to answer it, it's too premature to give a proposal and to start talking money because that, those are the times where you submit a proposal and it just kind of stalls, nobody, you know, and then you wonder what happened. And at the end of the day, if a sale isn't happening, we have to take accountability. If, if, if there's areas in our life that aren't working the way we want them to work. It's us, it's nobody else. So that's the, you know, the bad part is it's us and not anybody else. <laughs> As human beings, we always look for something to, to blame. But the great part is that it's us and nobody else and we can change whatever we're doing at the drop of a dime. So in sales, I see a lot of people blaming everybody else. Well, I didn't get the sale because I didn't have the right brochure or the price is too high or these people didn't give me the proposal in time. Like there's so many excuses. And I heard John Maxwell say, he said, it's way easier to go from failure to success than excuses to success. Oh, so that's probably the biggest takeaway today is if you're making excuses, recognize them and just call it a failure and start heading to success. <laughs> I, yes, I'm, I'm st I, I like that because, yeah, and so often in sales, you're right. The price isn't right. The market isn't right. The, this isn't like everything. Like, I'm good. It's everything around me that was wrong. And it's like, yeah. no, because you know what? Somebody else will probably walk in the door 10 minutes after you, and because they followed Eric's strategy, will close the deal with nothing more than yeah. the right strategy and right approach. Yeah, and so many people in the same company, same marketplace, live in the same city, make about the same amount of money. Well, no, probably one makes a lot more than the other, but one's killing it in sales and the other one is, you know, not doing very well. And 
the one that's not doing very well usually is blaming everybody else. And the one that's doing very well is usually saying, hey, I'm responsible for my own fate. And I think that goes back to, as you had said in the beginning, I guess we could say, don't be a follower, be a student. Study what you're doing. Don't be a follower, be a student. Study what yeah. you're doing. Study what the other guys are doing. Get a coach in there and get them to help you study and see what's going on. Because as you become a student and you go from undergraduate to graduate to master's to PhD to double PhD, life gets easier and your income goes up. And, you know, it's funny. I'm sure you often have the same experience. When I go on a listing appointment or go to meet with a real estate client, it's like two seconds. Like, okay, yeah, we want to hire. And I see new agents like, how did you do that? And it's like, because I've studied it. I have practiced it. I know exactly how I can go from here to there and what the journey should feel like and how to bring them along. And I'm still refining it every day. And I'm sure with you, you walk in and it's like one, two, three, we got the contract because you became a student. I wish, I mean, you know, I think what I know now is that it, it's not about one, two, three, get the contract. It's about just be present and listen to your client. It might be one, two, three, or it might be one, two, three years. <laughs> but <laughs> listen and don't rush it. Like, look, it's going to come when it comes. There's some things we can do to help it come quicker, but it, you're not going to be able to do it if you're forcing the client to do it. They're not going to be happy at the end of the day with the decision that they made. I, and I, and Amen. so it's all about the client. Um, yeah. So one, thank you for your service with our military as a Marine. Um, tough job, tough job. Thank you. Glad, to, but you know, would have been tougher if you had been a Coast Guard member. Just saying. <laughs> so that was for definitely. Job. I mean, John. John is a tough guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you guys are both awesome. I don't want people to think the only thing you do every day is sell copiers, printers, IT solutions, though you are the number one company in the entire DC, Maryland area to provide those services to individuals, companies, and corporations. In the world. In the world, sorry. <laughs> According to me. Okay. So you could actually like come to Georgia and solve the sol find a solution for a company? Yeah. You need something? I, no. There's no borders here, man. We're, I did. Yeah, you're, for we'll some reason, there. in my mind, I was thinking that, you know, I, I apologize. I'm an idiot. No, we're supposed to stay in this area. But if I have a friend in Georgia, we can come to Georgia. Or if you Not have, a, a or if the University yeah, of Georgia is looking for an entire campus-wide solution, you'll find a friend. There's no... <laughs> Nobody better than us to handle that for them, yeah. <laughs> but when you're not out selling, selling copiers and fax machines, toners, IT solutions for HRs and others, you still speak, coach, and train. I do. And you're Yeah, so go ahead, sir. I was going to say your ideal client or the venue that you are most comfortable in. So ideal client is now become a company that's got at least three to 12 salespeople. Um, they're small, they wanna to get to the next level, they have at least two to $5 million in revenue annually. Um, those seem to be the guys I do pretty well with. Um, talking about their leadership team, their sales management team, and their salespeople. Um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, it's anybody that feels stuck. Like I've had people, uh, a few of my clients they, that reached out to me, uh, reached out because they're like, look, I see you on Facebook at 5 a.m. posting. You got your ducks in line. And I don't know how to answer my emails. Like, and I know exactly what they're talking about. I know what that feels like when you're like, when you feel like you have your walls crushing, crashing down on you. And when we start working together, we just develop a quick routine. Like, what can we, you know, delegate? Talk to me about what do you have going on in the morning? How can we develop a routine? Or, hey, I'm stuck at this weight, I want to lose weight, or I'm not happy with my relationship. Uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not like a counselor or anything, but through coaching, um, I can help them kind of identify the goals, where they want to go, and then work with them to get there, holding them accountable every step of the way. So I love, I love all that stuff, man, just helping, adding value to people and helping them get from here to there.
That's what I like to do. And you, and you do it well. And what I like about your style of coaching, it's similar to mine. It's really about strategies and systems. I, I don't deny that you have feelings, but I really can't, I can't do anything with that. It's kind of like the fog that surrounds us. But if I can help you get into strategies, get into systems, get into habits, I know that you'll move far enough away from those feelings that they won't control you. You'll be able to begin to control your life. And so that's why I think you're phenomenal at what you do is because you do put on that, let's get into action and see where we end up instead of let's sit here and see what happens to us. Yeah, and the key is like, look, a lot of times it's very overwhelming for people. So I think what we do well is we break those actions down to a very manageable, small task that they can't see for themselves because they're looking at a mountain, right? So, hey, what can we do right now that gets us just one step closer to the top of that mountain? We don't need to get to the top today. And, yeah, it, it works pretty well. I think once anybody can take a big task and break it down to small pieces and prioritize them, life is easy. This book, by the way, I did that with this book, and my goal was to write 400 words per day. That's it. Some days I wrote 3,000 and some days I wrote 400, but never less than 400. And then before you knew it, the book was done. It's been a great book it was, in case I didn't say that. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Eric. I really appreciate this time with you. No, I, 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 this is selfish time. I get to read a great book and then dig in and ask <laughs> questions with it. It's like, it's like getting the audio track, the book, and the writer all in the same bundle. So... Aside from this coming on as an online course, anything else you got going on that people that love and like you can follow and get involved with you on? Yeah, I think if you're interested in sales, I just started a Facebook group. It's called the Gold Guides Sales Tribe. You can find it through my page. If we're not friends, let's connect and go through there. And then there's a, you know, a quick like lead book on it's a proposal writing guide. So how do you create a most effective proposal that you can download in exchange for your email and then you'll get some really cool emails from me. Right now it's one a week, usually getting out on Monday morning. Um, and that's all for now. I'm not trying to sell anything right now. I just want to build a tribe, um, you know, gain trust within the community and help people sell more of whatever it is that they're selling. So the That's proposal thing, I, I know somebody in our group the other day was looking for a proposal, how to write a proposal. So make sure they get on. And for those of you that don't understand his accent, because it's a little bit, you know, Brooklyn, -y, Maryland, -y, DC, -y, it's not <laughs> gold guide like in the mineral. It's goal like in score guide. So it's goal guide.com help you reach your goals yeah. <laughs> yes goal because you got guide. you got that That's accent it. you know that like come on you know what i'm talking about let's get some sauce and enjoy ourselves some dinner <laughs> i hope i don't sound like that <laughs> hey i'm from the midwest everybody has an accent but us um but no i it is goal as in to hit your goals guide um go check out the website sign up for the newsletter sign up for the proposal and what I would say is we're on this like New Year's resolution, goal setting, 2019. Download the, the proposal, fill it out like it's your ideal client, like, like everything is done except the signature. And have it sitting on the corner of your desk so that you are building into yourself the belief system that that proposal is already written. The only thing missing is the signature. And you wake up every morning and your job is to go out and find the person that needs to sign that. Because I truly believe, and I do believe, if you're in sales and you're stuck and that you're plateau and you're like, man, I'm so sick of only getting, you know, this three figure, where the four figure, where's the five, where the six figure life is, start read. whoops, sorry, um, start reading and following the strats. Don't think about them, do them, and you'll probably have that proposal finished and signed off by the middle of the year. That's just my coaching advice, strategy, thought. It's fair. I mean... Everything I wrote in there, we do every single day. The examples are stories of the team now. And we went from about 7 million to almost 15 million in the last four years. So um, the stuff works and it, it's shifting focus. And once again, I'm not like taking credit for all that. I'm just saying that I'm observing really good people at work and this is what's working, right? Um, the stuff works. 
Uh, it's good principles, and I didn't create them. I just put them into practice from guys like, um, gosh, Bob Proctor. I mean, Jeffrey Gittimer, John Maxwell. You know, all those guys have so many principles. Napoleon Hill. Did you know Napoleon Hill wrote a sales book? Yeah. Like. I just picked this up, you know, constantly staying a student. Like this thing says, uh, how to sell your way through life. I mean, sounds interesting to me. If it's one thing I don't, uh, one thing I don't save money on is books. <laughs> like if anything looks good, somebody mentions a book, I go right on Amazon and uh, I pick it up right away. I'll have to show you, um, I, it's way over there and I won't reach it, but so I got a pen and I got it on, I think I got it on Amazon, but it's, it was like 90 bucks, maybe a hundred, but you can scan using the pen. And so what I do uh -huh. now is when I finish a book, I'll scan all my highlighted parts. I print it out and then I tuck it in the back nice. of the book so that I have my, that's awesome. And so, yeah. And so you can scan it into a, like a digital format solution, but I have to use a printer cause I'm still old school. So like everything that I highlighted here, I'll take my little magic pen and I'll go back and scan it. And so what I do is I'll scan the chapter and then I'll scan the quote and I'll scan the page number. So when it's all printed out, I can be wow. like, okay, chapter three, he said this on page 21. And so all of the books on my bookshelf now will probably, like not all of them, but I'm trying to catch up, will have shoved in the back my scan note summaries. That's really cool. So it's an IT solution that you'll, I, I'll, I'll get my IT team to come in and do a set, an assessment and evaluation if it sits, fits with your needs. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I appreciate you so much for being here on Author Talk and sharing your book. Um, make sure that we go back and, and get the, are you selling it only through Amazon or do you have a private link as well? I don't have a private link right now. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles as well. Um, I think Amazon UK has them. Yeah, Amazon's the best way. I've had a private link and people are like, I have to fill in my information. I'm just going to go to Amazon. <laughs> so, okay. So a couple of things I'm going to ask you guys to do now, live replay, whenever you watch it. One, if you buy the book, shoot them a message or type down below, got the book. Um, then go back to Amazon and leave a comment. Amazon's algorithms and matrices rank books based on comments and feedback. Plus, it's important for the author who spent their heart attack recovery days writing a book to know that their book is actually reaching people. Um, I've had experience with authors that I've worked with that they not always does Amazon track and report the sales. You don't make a lot of money as an author, so the comments are worth their weight in gold so please buy the book leave a comment connect to eric and uh, make sure that uh, you follow up with him because he will be teaching this as an online course and i'm probably going to be in it just so you know <laughs> awesome he would love to have you in there <laughs> too easy thank in you room. guys for watching and really appreciate your time thank you much go play with the boys i'll talk to you later bye bye <laughs> all right bye